Have you ever thought about moving to St. Lucia? It's a stunning island with beautiful scenery and it's an amazing place to go on holiday, but what's it actually like to pick up sticks and move, move there? Today on the line, I am joined by the wonderful Denise Coleman, who did exactly that in the middle of the pandemic. So I can't wait to share her story. Denise, whereabouts in St. Lucia are you? And how would you describe St. Lucia to someone who's not familiar with it as a destination? So it sounds really cliche, um, but anyway, listen, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to, about, to just share our journey, really. But I guess uh, in terms of that really cliche thing, I think you would just have to describe St. Lucia as beautiful. It really is just spectacular. And we are very fortunate that where we live in VG, which is very close to Castries, um, is probably not more than a six seven minute drive straight out of Castries heading north um, we have the most spectacular view um, so if I look to the right I can see the small regional airport if I look straight ahead I'm looking right at the beach the beautiful Alden sands turquoise water and then if I look further ahead, I'm looking at a whole range of hotels. And then if I keep moving towards my left, I can see Pigeon Island. And then on a fabulous day, if I really turn left, I can see Martinique. Wow. So when I say I have a spectacular view, I am not exaggerating. And anybody who's been here, and actually when, I, when we came to see the house for the very first time, we had seen a number of properties by that. So we'd got quite a feel for what we really liked. And we had quite a clear top three list. So when we pulled up outside this house, I looked at my husband, my husband looked at me and we were like, really, why is he bringing us here? Um, and then he brought us into the house. We walked straight through the living room and onto the balcony and it's no exaggeration that I nearly burst into tears oh. because of the view. Because the description of the house says, um, unbelievable, spectacular view. You always take those things with a bit of a pinch of salt, but that's really what it is. And for us, it, it hit one of the top three. The top three were spectacular view, um, had to have a pool, and had to have lots of outdoor space because we're entertainers or rather we like entertaining others um and it hit all of those and that was it the rest of it just made it happen amazing see i've never been to st lucia actually but i've flown into st lucia and you can just okay. tell from the pitons from the coastline that it's magical oh. It's got it a, is. It is a vibe, absolutely magical. Even from inside an airplane. So I can imagine living there and having an awesome view. It must be even more just inspiring to wake up. And actually, I, I, it is exactly the right word is inspiring because I can wake up and do wake up every single morning, lift my head and see the view that I've just described from my bed. And then I can get out of bed and walk through the front room into onto the balcony and see that and if you for whatever reason are feeling a little low um it does give you quite a lift particularly if the sun is blaring mm. and then you think right okay I can get on with the rest of the day yeah and so just to, to make it even worse for people who are watching and who aren't in St Lucia how how would you describe that the comparative difference to waking up in the UK like what what you know what, there is no comparison, to be fair, because because of the view I've described. And obviously, you know, you're pretty much getting wall to wall sunshine. Having said that, the last couple of weeks have been pretty ropey, actually, if I'm being honest, very windy. But the, but the reality is, is that the UK is very often grey and cold and a little bit depressing at times. Um, and it was, I think I noticed over my, uh, over re recent years, kind of changing mood when the winter kicked in. Mm. Um, and I don't think it was anything drastic, but I definitely felt different. 
and I, we always, always have enjoyed holidays. We're, we're holiday people. We like two or three holidays a year. And there was never, ever a question around, it had to always be somewhere where there was sun. Right. It just always had to be sun whenever we went away. And it always did me the power of good. Um, so to get that constantly here, it's just great. It's a game great. changer for sure. I remember for me, probably for the last I don't know, 20 years, um, the worst day of the year was always when the clocks went back. It was like, it's coming, it's happened. Oh, six months of this, what am I doing here? If I'm, I'm going to be out in, in 12 months time, so I never have to experience it again. It didn't quite work out that way. It, it took a couple of decades for me to actually make it out. But <laughs> this year, when the clocks went back, I was like, boom, I am yeah. not in the UK. Um, yeah. I work remotely. So instead of having a five hour difference, time hour difference, there's four hours I had to get. Uh, exactly. How lovely exactly. to celebrate the uh, clocks going back because it was no longer my problem. And I can really relate to that, that, that change from five, five hours to four hours, just Oh, just, yeah, phenomenal. And also, um, the other thing that I really enjoy is that I'm getting up at five at the moment to start work, fine. But at 6.30, when the sun is coming up, I'm working. So I'm able to see that absolute beauty every morning. Um, and that is a real treat. Yeah. It's a real treat to actually see it in front of you as you're tick typing away but to see that in the background is is quite something and I that's probably one of the things that I photograph the most because sometimes it can just be just um, breathtaking actually and also the rainbows oh my goodness yeah. the rain uh, are mind-blowing the they are mind-blowing they are absolutely mind-blowing I feel like I they're so intense and vibrant, the colour. You feel like you could touch them. Mm -hmm. um, and again, because of where we are, you I think we just, yeah, we just get these most spectacular rainbows. So that has been a treat, a real treat. Yeah. We seem to have rainbows every other day here. It's strange oh, really? how frequently they happen. And the other thing, as much as sunrise and, and rainbows, is I don't know how it is where you are, but the lack of light pollution at night the fact that you can see the stars and a full moon, you can see the shadows from the moon. Like in the UK, you're just so indoors or just, you miss all of that. And it's really grounding, oh, I find. So yes, again, the stars. I remember when we'd moved, you know, quite early on when we moved in the house and we were always outside every evening, just, just trying to, just trying to take it all in. The enormity of the move, the fact that we had moved into this house that we've absolutely fallen in love with, you know, the enormity of all of that emotion. Um, and then just looking up and seeing, oh my God, there's the stars. Oh my gosh, you don't see stars in. <laughs> and I remember Richard looking at me like I was a little bit strange, but it was just like, oh my God, there's the stars and there's the moon and just, nature at its very very best so yeah I absolutely can relate those that yeah it really resonates with me mm. and I just love overall the way it makes you really appreciate simple things simple things because we're so pleasurable so so pleasurable but okay I think some people might be turning off because it's just too much and but let's talk <laughs> about how you got there so other people can work yeah. through that for themselves because sure. what I love about you is that neither you nor your husband are from St Lucia so everything you're going you're gonna to say is going to be very honest and just like your experience. So no sure. rose tinted glasses. So what, sure, absolutely. Tell, me, tell me where you're from and how this seed of, of moving abroad came, came to fruition. So yeah, so my family are from Guyana. I've been to Guyana on a number of occasions. Richard's family are from Jamaica. He's been to Jamaica, but that's not where we, either of us wanted to get married. We just knew we wanted to get married abroad. Um, and I remember um, having made that decision saying, right, I'll just go to the travel agent because in those days it was travel agents on the high street, went off to Thomas Cook, got some brochures and looked at St. Lucia. In fact, the first place I really wanted was Hawaii, oh. um, but, the, but the prices were, were, were unbelievable. And then saw St. Lucia and thought, oh my gosh, that just looks 
amazing and looked at the hotel and thought oh that is fabulous and that's what we booked and that's what we decided so we arrived um it was bank holiday august weekend uh, 1999 um and we arrived because we had to be here five days before you could actually get married to do some of the legal work the wedding planner within the hotel made that all very simple and very straightforward and very easy for us. And we got married. We got married on the 3rd of September on the beach at the rendezvous. And it was just, as you would imagine it, just phenomenal. Um, the only sadness was that I didn't have all of my friends and family there but I had enough to make it really special because my dad had flown in from Guyana, um, Richard's brother and sister had flown in and we had met a couple of couples at the hotel before we'd got married and they joined. It was really small, really intimate, but it was lovely. And we just said at the time, having then really just, and I don't know what it was in particular, but we'd just fallen in love with the country. We just enjoyed the vibe, um, the people, the culture, the food, the rum, mm -hmm. um, the sun, and the beauty of the land. And we just said, look, if we, if we make it, this is where we'll come back in later years. And 22 years later, here we are. Um, and yeah, have zero regrets, but it is challenging. Um, we did the whole process of moving during COVID, which as you can imagine is challenging. So as much as we had seen the home that we now live in, in the December of 2019, we'd physically seen it and we saw it a couple of times before we said yes. We then had to come back straight to the UK and put our house up on the market. Um, and that was January 2020. COVID then kicked in in the March 2020. And just before the country went into absolute lockdown was when we got our first offer on the house. And then, of course, it all went quiet. Right. Until things started to reopen a little bit in the May and we could start the transaction again. And then, you know, long story short, that sale fell through. Um, and it was like, oh my gosh, all this time, we're really worried and really concerned that this house here in St. Lucia would be sold. And I remember saying to the estate agent here, please, please just don't take anybody else to the house. Just please tell them it's awful. Tell them it's falling down. Tell them anything, but don't take them to the house. And he said, Denise, I'll do what I can. He just said, uh, uh, I'll tell them there's some really ugly, horrible bogs around it. <laughs> they won't like it there. Um, anyway, we then got another sale in the September and we managed to exchange and complete in the December. And we exchanged and completed on this house on the 23rd of December. As you can imagine, those days, those dates are engraved on my mind and yeah. will be forever because it was really quite challenging, quite stressful. Um, you know, trying to sell a house in the UK, as you know, is challenging in its own right. But when you're trying to do that and purchase across the other side of the world in COVID, whoa, it was, you know, it was quite something. Right. But had a phenomenal lawyer here. She was absolutely first class who helped me navigate everything. She was just all over it and it happened. Um, and yeah, zero regrets um, because the moment when we were out of our two week quarantine when we arrived and came to the house for the first time, bearing in mind we hadn't seen it for you know the best part of a year at that point it was all of that kind of emotion of will it be just what we remembered will it still be as wonderful as we thought it was going to be is it still going to be right and that moment when we opened the key uh, opened the door and came in here it was just like yeah this is it this is what we fell in love with this feels great and we just took it from there. Yeah, I spoke to another lady who moved to St. Lucia also during the whole COVID situation, probably the same time around here actually, maybe you were on the same flight, but she said that when <laughs> she got out of quarantine and sat on the beach, she actually just cried, you know, from all of the stress, 
everything that needed to happen, wanting it so long, like you're finally there. And I think for you guys, you moved at a time when there were restrictions, right? Because in, in December, just before Christmas, Absolutely. I remember because I hadn't done my Christmas shopping. They're like, no, all shops are closed. You're not supposed to travel. We're cancelling flights. So yeah, Correct. it's really like that those movies where the walls are closing in and will you manage to get out in time and you did it. So that's a, that's huge. You must have been very It is crazy. huge. It, it's, it was enormous. And I can't, I can't explain that in, enough, how enormous the whole thing was. You know, the moving out of one home, moving our sons into another home, us having to move in with them because we didn't know when we could, were able to travel because as you said, the world was really closing in. Uh, all of our stuff that was planned to be moved to St. Lucia in storage somewhere, um, it was all just, you know, full on. Um, and then when we did, when we were able to book our flights, because of the intensity of the lockdown, we couldn't say goodbyes to people properly. You know, my husband's family are all in Manchester. We couldn't go to Manchester and do the proper goodbyes and cry and hug and party and all of that stuff. We just couldn't do it. We just had to keep it really contained because everybody was aware that we needed to have our PCR test to leave. So people were very conscious of not meeting us. So a few people that we did meet to say goodbye to, we met in parks and just waved from a distance. It was wow. all bizarre. Insane. Um, it was, it was really insane. And we did feel like we were leaving like two criminals in the night, sneaking out literally. And I think the other two things were very quickly were getting to Gatwick Airport. And bear in mind, we're travellers. We know what the airport's like and used to the busyness. It was like a absolute ghost town. Hmm. I have never seen the airport like that. I was also highly emotional by that point. So I was crying and crying and crying. <laughs> what have I done? I had remember... Uh, as we got into the taxi, leaving my son, one of my sons, my youngest, I could just see him at the window with a tear running down his eyes. And in that moment in the taxi thinking, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't leave him like that. But then, you know, in those seconds, you kind of talk to yourself and think yourself through and say, no, it'll be fine. This is what we've planned to do. Just go. So, so yeah, so Gatwick was really airy was even more peculiar as we got on the plane a nine-hour flight to St Lucia and there was 28 people on the flight wow because that that was it that was COVID 28 people on a huge jumbo to St Lucia 28 of us and that was it and it was bizarre it was it was it was a really crazy experience um and again you know that nine-hour flight you know, I don't recall sleeping very much, just thinking, have I done everything? Have I remembered everything? Is everything packed? Are my children going to be okay? When am I going to see them? It, it just, mm. nine hours of all of that going right. through. Because you were leaving not knowing if things were going to get worse, if they were going to get better. So stepping into all that uncertainty, yeah, wow. <laughs> Absolutely. And when we got here, it was pretty, it was pretty severe. Um, so actually in the hotel, I did imagine and had been told you would be forced to stay in your room, meals brought to you. It wasn't like that, to be fair. Um, we had freedom around to walk around the hotel. We had our dinners out in the restaurants and all of that sort of stuff. But we were also able to go to the other hotel's beaches in the afternoons. So I worked in the morning on UK time. And then in the afternoons, we would spend the time on the beach. It felt a bit like a holiday. But I think that was also strange because <laughs> it wasn't a holiday. You know, we were coming to yes. live. So it's kind of a little bit strange. And you could almost fall into that trap in that two weeks of thinking, oh, we're on two weeks holiday, we'll be going back to the UK. And actually, no, it wasn't like that. I think the moment that the estate agent delivered the keys to the hotel reception was the moment I thought, and I ran downstairs to go and get them, was the moment I thought, oh, no, this is not a holiday. We're staying. Here's the keys to the house. Um, so then, so then, yeah, we got the keys and uh, after day 12, I remember going to the receptionist and saying, look, you've tested us every single day. 
I have a house that I want to go and live in and I want to do another couple of days here. I want out. And she said, you can't leave. I said, hold on a second. Hold on a second. I've been here 12 days. I followed all the rules. Mm. I just want to leave now. And she said, I understand. She said, I'll check. Anyway, they allowed us to leave a day early, which was better than nothing. Um, and on the day that we were supposed to leave, they wanted us to stay right until the end of the day. And I said, absolutely no. I'm going now. I've booked a taxi and I'm going. Um, and we left and we got here. And yeah, we've done all sorts of things in the house because we had time to think it through because we couldn't do anything. The restrictions at that point, uh, January 2021 here in St. Lucia were tight. It was curfews. So you were, I think the curfews were four o'clock every day, maybe six. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it was four. Uh, so you were only allowed to go out in the morning up until four o'clock and then you were made to stay at home. Um, no bars and restaurants were open. Only the supermarkets, literally, uh, and literally just the supermarkets. No other retail shops were open, no bars, no restaurants, no rum shops, no nothing. It was locked down. And the protocols were severe, you know, sanitizing, temperature checks everywhere. And actual fact, when I went back to the UK last year, so, so yeah, the June of 2021, I went back for a visit. I was really bowled over by how lax yeah. protocols were in the UK in comparison, because literally here at that time, if you were stepping into a shop in St. Lucia, the security guard would literally wrestle you to the ground <laughs> to sanitize you and temperature check you. And then I step into the UK and everyone's just, yeah, you can't go anywhere in uh, St. Lucia without a face mask. Yeah. Um, so when I stepped back into the UK, people were just casually walking around. I was like, whoa, where am I? Type thing. So yeah, um, thankfully the protocols are relaxing now. Um, and in actual fact, last night they confirmed that the curfew is now till 12 midnight. So effectively not a curfew at all. Um, and all of the bars and the restaurants have been open for some time. So life is starting to return to normal here. So my view on that is that if we have enjoyed St. Lucia in lockdown, imagine now that we've got all of this freedom, how phenomenal it's going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. In Grenada, we had um, lockdown weekends when you weren't allowed to leave your house from Friday evening till Monday morning. And it never made me appreciate my freedom as much as when that was lifted. Like just even being able to go to the beach because there are times where we weren't allowed to go to the beach, simple stuff like that. Correct. Thank you. I can walk Correct. to the beach. I can, so yeah, it, 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 for us, it was tough, especially with three young kids. It was, I wouldn't Yeah, that was really again. challenging. But it's, yeah, you grow with it. You learn from it and yeah. You do you. And you, yeah, you just have to run with it mm -hmm. and accept that there is something significant going on across the world mm -hmm. that you just have to work with. So yeah, that's exactly what we do. Yeah. And I guess it's also a choice between, do I want to walk around without a mask and unsanitized hands in England in the cold? <laughs> Or do I want to be in Grenada where there have been more restrictions? It's, it's choices. And I think there's no such thing as perfection. The idea that you're yeah. going to live abroad and everything is going to be great, that's just not reality. But it's choosing what's important to you and what's not, ultimately. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talk about some of the, the slightly less exciting parts. But okay. how are you... So have you been able to... How does a, a foreigner move to St. Lucia? Are you and your husband both... Um, Guyanese and, and Jamaican citizens so you're able to do that because you're part of CARICOM or how tell me talk absolutely about not we're both born in the born and bred in the UK okay um so when we arrived it was you get your normal visa stamp in your passport mm -hmm. um and then all we did when we when the first stamp was running out is we went to the immigration office and asked what do we do now um and it was a, a straight, a fairly straightforward process of you leave your passport with them, you get a receipt for it, obviously, and then you go back and it's been stamped and it gets stamped for a further six months. Okay. So I've just done that actually for the third time. What I was told last time 
when I went to get an extension, so that would have been extension number two, was told that because we own property here, the next time you come, you may well be able to apply for citizenship. So I was like, oh, great, happy days. Herein lies the challenge with St. Lucia. And the not so fun part is dealing with government offices here, uh, sometimes dealing with people in general can be really difficult. Uh, in the this particular office, just not very helpful and certainly not forthcoming with information and very antiquated in how they work. So, you know, in the UK, you can apply for your passport online. You can't do that stuff here. It is mountains of paper. And it's not even, this is gonna sound bizarre, but this really freaks me out. It's not even official paper. It is clearly photocopied pieces of paper. So the documents are offline, squinted, part of it missing because it's been photocopied so many times. And I find that stuff bizarre um, and really annoying and quite frustrating and really antiquated. And they're like, really? You can't get stuff like that right. Um, but like I said, just sometimes, and it is, so the point being, it can be very hit and miss. It is very dependent on who you meet, mm -hmm. the quality of the information and the quality of the interaction. If you are unfortunate to meet someone who's not having a good day, mm -hmm. you're going to feel that. Mm -hmm. And it's not nice. And also the length of time it can take to get what I would consider something really simple done. It can take hours because... Um, that piece of paper's got to be done in triplicate. Then it's got to go to that person for them to do something else on the bottom. And then they're going to pass it to that person in that other office over there. And quite often they're not telling you all of this. So you're just having to ask, what is going on? Just wait. Mm -hmm. My lady, just wait. Uh, and I find that really, really aggravating because I'm a big customers come first person you know if one of my team doesn't deliver service trust me you're going to know about it because I think it's a real basic um so I find that super frustrating about St Lucia um that sometimes it's just not delivering in the way that it could and should um and I think it's also in some respects service and the lack of technology of the things that are holding this beautiful country back. And again, I find that frustrating. So for example, opening a bank account was singularly the most painful experience I've been to or been through in a very long time. Yeah, Bearing so in you're mind- brave, you know, You're brave to try and open a bank account. You must, I'll take I did it before doing it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I would recommend that. Um, and it wasn't that we needed it, if I'm being honest. It's not like you can't function. I just wanted it. And I didn't think it would be that difficult. Bear in mind, you know, I'd opened a, a Starling bank account on my sofa in the UK before I left. And it took 10 minutes, I think, and uploaded a photograph and it was all done. And then to come here and um, what, was, what was so difficult about it? Again, the lack of service, the lack of appreciation that... Um, you were from the UK, you needed information, you needed a bit of, you needed help to work through how the process worked. But I think the second thing was the request for information was ridiculous. And I ended up having a bit of a meltdown in the bank and the individual saying, do you want to speak to the manager? And I said, absolutely because this is unbelievably ridiculous. Um, and the man manager called me in and he was very pleasant. He says, come on, what, what is it that's frustrating you? And I just said, your process, your process is unwieldy and unnecessary. I said, unfortunately, not a title that I like, but I am a GDPR lead. So I understand what data protection means. And I understand the kind of information you need, but also the kind of information you don't need to open a bank account. And you're asking too much information from me. It is not necessary for you to know all of that 
just to open a bank account. I'm not asking you for a loan or a mortgage or anything of the sort. I'm just wanting a basic bank account to deposit a small amount of money in to maybe pay some local bills. You're asking way too much information. Um, and I found that really intrusive. So yeah, I explained all of that and I, he, yeah, he did understand. And I just said, you are holding the country back by these antiquated processes, the lack of technology. And I you know, went on to explain how you can do things in the UK and I'm not, and I said, I was very clear in saying, I chose to come here. This was my decision to come here. So I'm not saying that you have to do what they do in the UK, but I wanted to share with you why I'm frustrated is because of the way you can do things versus the way you're doing things here. And actually, bearing in mind this is a country that appears to welcome people to come and live and purchase property here. Therefore, you should make things easier for people to navigate. Um, so I said, do you have a mechanism? So this is me with my <laughs> senior management leadership head on now. Do you have an opportunity to feedback to your senior managers within the banking organization to tell them these things? Because uh, I really went into it then because I was just frustrated. Um, so we had a long conversation and, and it, to be fair to him, he really did listen and he took, took my feedback on board and I think he took it seriously and he then resolved my issues and opened my bank account for me. But how many other people who maybe are not as forthright as I am mm -hmm. um, and who would have just walked away and just said, forget it, I can't, be, I can't be bothered to do this. And I think that's one of the things that people need to be mindful of when they come to St. Lucia and potentially to other Caribbean countries. Yeah. You have to be quite forthright yeah. and you have to be clear about what you want and don't take any nonsense would be my view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we could do an entire series on my trying to open a bank account experience in every island because it is incredibly onerous and yeah, the amount of stuff that's asked for. But I think part of it, if I remember correctly, is to do with... Um, Money laundering. Yes, yeah. And in many instances, because there are correspondent banks, the banks here don't necessarily get to, to set their own rules. So in many ways, while it, it does feel very backwards and makes zero sense at all. It's because that's what they have to do in order to be able to. And I think that's I always the quandary about the Caribbean, isn't it? Is that there's stuff that doesn't make sense, but a lot of it is stuff that's been imposed 50, 100, 200 years ago. And unfortunately, there's never really been the chance to just chuck it all out the window. And, and I, I completely understand that. But even still, I still think they can streamline, improve, utilize technology to help with some of these processes yeah. and to make everybody's life a lot easier. So, and I think that would be my overwhelming piece of feedback uh, had I, you know, generally is more use of technology. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I found phenomenal here is they use social media really well. Um, I see some phenomenal businesses on Instagram. Um, and there's lots of, and again, one of the things I'm really enjoying here is seeing lots of fabulous black women entrepreneurs doing their thing and utilizing social media to make it happen. I'm loving that, absolutely loving that. And some of the fun experiences and things I've done here has been as a direct result of searching and looking at things on Instagram. Um, so I love that. But then on the flip side from a you know bank account or just normal processes type thing is not using technology to the same effect. And I find that a bit baffling. Yeah. But on one hand, they're doing it really well. And on the other hand, not so much. Um, so yeah, so things like that. Yeah, no, here in Grenada, they have um, a thing with stamps. Everything needs a stamp, but not like a stamp, like an actual stamp. I'm like, Correct. why do this need a stamp? And why do I need to go from one office to another office just to Correct. stamp that can't you just Correct. Yeah. And trying to get stuff from the port, that is like, yeah. And I think my approach is just, what I think is logical is actually 
there's no such thing as pure logic. It's my British logic. And from a Grenadian perspective, that makes sense. And sometimes I just have to <laughs> let it go out the window. There's a, a friend I've been working with. He's been running um, a grocery delivery business here since right. 2016. So he delivers to hotels, to yachts, to private islands, and he's been doing it successfully. Um, and during the pandemic, there was such a demand for his services because obviously people weren't allowed to go to the shops. If you did, it meant queuing in the sun for three hours. So I was watching him getting all this <laughs> demand. And I was like, why didn't you just set it up online? People can order what they want, pay, etc." You would think like in the UK, <laughs> people are throwing online banking at you. You just click and as you say, you're set up in 20 minutes. Um, we applied for an account in, September, early September, and in December, so three months later, just before Christmas, they said, oh, sorry, we can't. This is a guy who's been running for, for years. He's known, he has access. And yet it's, and to me, it makes, it makes no sense. And as you say, it's holding things back, like getting to yeah. go with technology seems like it's not even risky. It, it happens across the world. Yeah. World, exactly. Exactly. And I think there's so much to learn. And I think that fundamentally, when I think about, well, why am I frustrated by this? It's because actually this country has so much to offer. It could really blossom and be economically sound and more sustainable if it embraced certain things because it would transform how this country operates. And that is why I get frustrated because it is holding itself back. That's it. Yeah, and I think for sure there's no doubt a huge sway of solutions who want things to be done differently. I know from speaking oh, here- Very much so. Made it, but it's just, when will it happen? I don't know. This guy so. putting all his business out on the internet, but um, he had an event and a representative from the bank came along and the prime minister was there and the other ministers right. were there and he was going to go back and report and like that really shouldn't be necessary just to open an online bank account you shouldn't need ministerial approval just to be able to take transactions online it's really not that hard so yeah I try to be as like open and understanding and aware as possible that some stuff just doesn't doesn't make any sense doesn't absolutely but absolutely and tell me yeah, it's about balance because I think people that know me well had said, even before I left the UK, my boss in particular <laughs> said to me, are you going to be all right? Because the Caribbean works very differently and we know what you like. When you want something done, you want it done now. How are you going to cope with that? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I know. I know, but I'll be okay. I'm sure it will be fine. Whew. But I think over the year, I have tried to chill mm -hmm. on things that just, you know what, Denise, actually in the big scheme of things, is it that important? Just let it go. Um, in a way I would never have done in the UK. Mm -hmm. I would just would never have done that. So I am learning, but it is a journey. Yeah, he's an absolute journey. Whereas my husband is just chill. As a human, he's chilled. If he was any more chilled back, he'd be horizontal. I am the opposite. When I want something, I want it now. I want it today. So for me, from a personal learning growth perspective, that has been the thing for me is to just work out what's really important and needs to get done and you're going to need to persevere and what actually you know what in the big scheme of things just let it go just let it go but it's a journey but I'm on it excellent excellent well I'm on it too I'm reason I thought I was chill. no I am chill but yeah there's times when I'm just like feel the red mist and I'm like no gotta just accept that this is how it is and screaming isn't going to make any difference um oh denise i've loved talking to you i feel like we've only just scratched the surface um what <laughs> else do i want to ask you what else do i want to ask you um so tell me about your remote working situation how that came sure. about and then also if you can remember this question what you do when you're not working what does life in sure. the look like for you sure absolutely so the remote working thing so so when i 
started in with the organization that I work for now about which is almost five years ago now we had already started to do the thinking about Saint Lucia then in a more serious way we were already starting to think about the future so I remember in the interview process saying to him to the MD then when I was asked that fairly standard question of um not directly, but how long are you going to be around for type thing? I very openly said, listen, I can't commit to, you, to being here forever or even for the next five years because my longer term ambition is to move to St. Lucia. But while I'm here, you'll get everything I've got. So the, the St. Lucia thing had been mentioned quite, you know, quite a while ago. Um, and I think then it was just about things happening, things changing, starting to feel more around this is what we need to do. So then 2018, 2019 was around coming here and spending time. So not in hotels, villas, so you could do the shopping, you know, work out what, what you can buy and what you can't buy and what the prices are like and driving around and all of that sort of stuff. We did that. And then looking at properties to work out whereabouts in the island we wanted to be. Um, and then, like I said, 2019, we came, December, it happened. Um, but I think in terms of the remote working specifically, it was, a, it was that conversation at the point where I said to my boss, I'm putting the house up for sale in the UK. I think this is going to happen this year. And then COVID kicking in. And him thinking... <laughs> what am I going to do if she's gone? I think because I think he would openly say that, and him just saying, "Would you consider? Would you consider working for me in Saint Louis?" And I was like, "Well, actually, I've never really thought about it, but yeah, why not?" Um, because I think at the same time as him asking me that question, in my head I was also thinking, "What am I going to do mm. when I'm?" I know I want the change in lifestyle. I know I want the weather. I know I want to do something different, but I also know myself well enough to know that sitting on the veranda or on the beach seven days a week is not for me. So it all just came together beautifully, if I'm honest, with him saying he would love me to carry on working, me having these, own, these other personal thoughts, and it just coming together and being in COVID and working remotely and everything running perfectly well, it was just like perfect storm. Someone was looking out for me, I think. Um, so the, the most important thing when I got here or actually the estate agent did for me was make sure the uh, internet Wi-Fi was sound in this house so that I could work because it's, it's critical. You can't work remotely without phenomenal internet connection uh, and my boss says to me and my and the team say to me now you know my internet connection here in St Lucia is better than it was in Croydon mm -hmm. most of the time um, so that works um, so for me what I have is balance I have what I need for me which is to work because I love to work but then I get these other days where I get to do what I want to do. And what do I get to do on those other days? Chill, step back a little bit, because I think again, people that know me well will know that I was always moving at 400 miles an hour, always, every day, even on a Saturday and a Sunday, I always felt this need to be doing something, planning something, organizing something. So here, forces me to just kick back a little bit. The beach, there isn't anything more magical than walking along the beach. Mm. Um, we can walk from, from where we are straight to the hotel where we got married to. Um, we can walk all the way in the sun. We can stop on the way back at the beach bar and have a little rum punch, what's not to like. Uh, we can jump in the car 15 minutes down to Rodney Bay and enjoy all the bars and restaurants that there are to enjoy. And actually, if anyone's wondering what that must be like, you've got everything you can possibly want from really local, small, shack type, local homemade food to top end 
depends what you want, but you can get it here. And I love that variety. Um, we meet friends. So one of the big things for me, particularly this year, so year two of living in St. Lucia is about developing my network of friends because I need that, I want that. Um, but I'm glad that we've been able to do some, some of that in year one. So meeting up with friends, um, either usually eating and drinking to be fair, um, but, but, but chatting and having fun. Um, shopping, I am one of the world's biggest shopaholics. Um, so I can't shop to the same extent as I used to in the UK, but you know what, that's a good thing. Um, because actually my shopping habits were probably a little bit out of control in the UK. Um, and you can't shop like that here, um, but you can get what you need. Uh, you can buy clothes here or you can ship them in from America. Or as I have friends and family come in, I, sh I order them online and have them delivered to their house and they'll bring them with me. My sons are due out in a couple of weeks time and I know half of their suitcases have got stuff that I've ordered. And they're like, mom, really? Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so so you can manage it that way um and then yeah you know we're fortunate enough to have a pool so believe it or not I've never been able to swim uh -huh. and now because I have a pool I can now swim awesome. so that's amazing um so yeah just just yeah Chilling, reading. I am a, I'm one of those people that always brought books but never read them. And now I'm able to, because I've got space in my brain, I can now read. I can sit and chill and read in the sun. Um, and that's fabulous. And I can catch up on all the Netflix programs that I want to because I've got time to do that. Um, I think this year, is going to be busier with friends and family because the first year we were here 2021 lockdown restrictions protocols 700 million pcr tests very few people came last year this year i have a calendar full of people that are coming to visit do you know what that suits me because they're only people that i love mm. Um, and want to spend time with and I'm happy to open my home to but also as individuals we like entertaining so having people here really tops me up because I get to fuss and I get to plan so the people that are coming this year already if I could show you I can show you the itineraries that I've planned for them already yeah. um, so yeah so so having the injection of family and friends is just fabulous. It's just lovely. Just, yeah, it's just lovely. And to see their face when they arrive. Um, and again, when they see the view, just seeing their faces is, is everything. So. so I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. It does. And I'm, yeah, I'm like glowing from just how amazing it feels. And I think what you've done is really show the power of setting an intention, being bold about it, speaking on it, and sort of just staying focused. Like COVID might come, the challenge of a house sale might may come, but once you're focused on what you want to do, even like your son crying in the background, you know that ultimately it's for the greater good and he gets to come out and see his mum and bring a whole load of clothes. And you know, he does. He does. And just to pick up on that point, because that, that image of him crying, the day we were leaving will always be etched on my mind. But when he came here November of last year for the first time, I mean, just knowing that he was coming was enormous in itself. But when he came and he came into the house and he walked around and then looked at the view, he just looked at me straight in the eye and said, I get why you're here now. That was it. Yeah. that was all I needed yeah um but also I would just say to anybody it's not easy so don't for a moment think that anything I've said means it's easy mm -hmm. it isn't but it is about setting your intention if that's what you want but I think that's true of most things in life if that's what you want you need to go for it two you need to be organized you need to know what you're doing when you're doing it. So 
get your plan together, you know, map it out. I guess that was slightly easier for me because I am naturally a little bit of a planner. But having a plan and noting it, putting it on paper and getting your timeline right is really important. Do things like connecting the Facebook groups because there are lots of Facebook groups that I connected with prior to coming so I could see what people were talking about and I tried to connect with people prior. Do that. And this, the third thing I would say is put yourself out there because you're going to have to deal with some experiences that maybe you don't want to or haven't had to or didn't think to. You just have to, 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 to embrace it and run with it because you're going to learn something as a result of it. So it's about embracing those issues, even the most frustrating things that I've talked about. You just have to embrace those, run with that, learn from that because my impatience and wanting everything done has been tested hugely but you know what I'm better for having had those experiences and maneuvering through them because I'm slightly less impatient now slightly less demanding now and that can only be a good thing um so yeah set that intention and plan and work towards it and try and connect with people so I guess, it, again, if I'm being honest, it's slightly easier for me because I, because my work has always forced me to do that. I've always had to connect with people. But I think one of the things that I was told when we went to this kind of moving to the Caribbean successfully workshop, which, by the way, was probably the best £24 I've ever spent, was around, you know, making sure that you create your own network uh, when you're in the island of your choice because it's very easy to come stick to each other and become quite isolated uh, and that's dangerous because that will be potentially when things unravel or you just miss home too much because you haven't got other things to keep you alive and to keep you buzzing around so put yourself out there make those efforts to connect with people make the effort to meet people um because you also you learn stuff when you meet with other people you learn other things um so yeah so but 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 yeah if it's if it's what you want to do go for it yeah go for it was that event by black history walks yes i meant to go to that and i really wish i'd gone they used to do them like maybe every six months or so and I always plan to correct go. but what was really uh, the guy was it Paul Walker or yes yeah so he I got in touch with him and he was writing a book based on all of those and based on his experiences in, in Jamaica on how to move to the Caribbean but he passed away it's very sad did you know him no not personally um I had just seen those sessions being advertised on Facebook and obviously it coincided with us and our plans. And I thought, you know what, it's 12 pounds a ticket. It's in Westminster, what's not to like? So we went and honestly, like I said, it was just the best 24 pounds, just so many little nuggets to, to think about. Um, networking was one of the big things he talked about and the other big thing was he talked a lot about potentially when you move to the Caribbean you want this really idyllic setting um, up in the hills miles away from anywhere and he said be careful mm -hmm. he said don't ever buy or live anywhere in the Caribbean where an ambulance can't come to you if you need it and that sounds really blunt but it's so true because when we came and were looking around, we saw some phenomenal properties, but you know what? They were up in the hills. And I hear that, heard that voice and said, no, it's very pretty up here, but the roads are rough. It's too isolated. If one of us was really ill, how would anybody get to us? So those little nuggets were so helpful. So if you ever see any workshops like that, go. It, it was worth it. And I remember leaving the workshop and we went and sat in a in a bar and just we just kind of digested it all. And there's me with my notepad, you know, trying to capture all of those things. 
to to keep hold of um but yeah they really 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 useful mm. maybe we should recreate them with all the folks i think that, that would be if, if there was some way of collectively a group of us doing something mm. like that that for me would feel like would feel really positive and really constructive because i know how useful that was for me timing is everything obviously it just fell at the right time but i would love to be able to give back based on my experience through some other way so when you connected with me i was like oh that feels scary but i would love to if only if it helped someone else i absolutely would want to do that and actually as a result of being in a couple of other facebook groups a couple of people who are thinking about it have connected with me personally and i've said absolutely whatever i can do i will help you because yeah. it's a daunting prospect it's not impossible and it's, none of it is insurmountable but it can be quite daunting so i would love to be able and actually from a business perspective because there's lots of things from a business perspective that I'm still thinking through. One of them is some sort of concierge type service helping someone to make that transition. So I haven't thought all of that through, but it's on my list of things that I really want to think more about, explore, put some plans in place to develop. So who knows? Well, I think folks should just get in touch with you anyway, so you can think about it even more actively, because it's so needed. Like, I remember we lived in Spain in Ibiza, and having people who could just direct you through, it saves so much time. It saves so much time. And in the Caribbean especially, where it's so much about who you know, and understanding right. that things might happen differently, being able to navigate, navigate that just saves a lot of stress. A lot of stress. It does. No. Shames a, a lot of stress, a lot of time, and also money. Yeah. So those are the big, 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 huge learnings. But and when I say money, in terms of things like you know, if you want something built or if you want work done in your house, just knowing great tradesmen, of which there are many, but you need to know who they are. Just that Absolutely. in itself. You're speaking to someone who's now looking at potentially having her floorboards relayed for a third time. <laughs> Right. working with the right tradesmen or choosing to go there you go so yeah there you go exactly that exactly that so yeah so um, yeah Denise it's been awesome chatting to you um I hope at some point I get to pop to St Lucia and check out your amazing absolutely you'd be more than welcome feel free don't just sit on the runway and look <laughs> give me a shout <laughs> awesome and yeah I just really wish you everything um just the best with your journey it sounds like a year in you're already doing a lot you're really making it work and accepting of the challenges and realizing that there's some stuff that you can start change some stuff that you can't but ultimately you're where you want to be and how inspiring for your sons you know to have a mum who's yeah. following a dream and I hope so I, I genuinely hope so as much as it's obviously been a challenge for them not having mum and dad around I hope that they will see it like that um that wow look look what's possible mm -hmm. when you work hard put your mind to certain things go for it look what's possible so yeah absolutely really important for me to to leave a legacy like that yeah. and for my grandchildren too